Welcome to Mosaic. I'm your host, Susan Schulman Pertnoy. Mosaic is Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County's weekly news magazine, exploring the most critical issues facing Jews here and around the world. Deep divides are a regular part of today's discourse. The Jewish community is no exception, especially on topics related to Israel. We're sitting down with renowned journalist David Horowitz, founding editor of the Times of Israel and former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. We'll be right back with Mosaic. You are the book that lights the spark and the hand that passes the torch, the fuel that powers the change that betters the world across town, across oceans, the hand that soothes the spirit that survived the unthinkable. You are there in the darkest of times to strengthen our community. Good Greek moving in storage. Your superhero movers. More moving horror stories. Think it's a good idea for your friends to show up with pizza and beer to help you move? Wrong. Uh, Amateurs. As a former police officer, I've heard all of the moving horror stories. But you can trust me and my pros, and we'll have you saying... Opa! Call Star Star Greek. Good Greek, moving in storage. Your superhero movers. The Levin Palace at Morse Life is leasing luxury residences for ages 65 plus, offering more than first-class amenities and white glove service. Life at the palace is like life aboard a luxury cruise ship with more things to enjoy life now. More fabulous food, more fun, more friends, more family, more freedom, more future. Morse Life is more life. Live it at the palace. Start your fabulous future now. Call 561-537-3402. We're here with David Horowitz, the founding editor of the Times of Israel. David, welcome to Mosaic. Thank you, thanks a lot. You were raised in England. What was your Jewish identity like growing up? Uh, I come from a pretty orthodox Jewish family. Um, I, indeed, I grew up in London. I moved to Israel when I was 20. My family on my father's side were an orthodox rabbinical family in Germany. Um, that, you know, quite a common mix of very Orthodox Jews, but very, you know, very German. My grandfather uh, fought as a conscript in the German army in World War I. He won the Iron Cross. I have his Iron Cross oh at home, goodness. you know, which you, when you think of what that came to represent in World War II, it's quite something. Uh, and they fled in 37. It took them quite a long time to realize that Germany was not going to kick out the Nazis. And they, so they came to England. And um, my father was a volunteer in the RAF in World War II, so that's a pretty, you know, pretty radical switch in the space <laughs> yes. of a generation. But yeah, I grew up um, pretty orthodox. I have an uncle in Jerusalem who's the head of the yeshiva, which is, you know, actually that this particular um, facility is aimed at people who were, were not orthodox and who he's kind of encouraging to become orthodox. I kind of went the other way. Um, the, the synagogue I don't go to terribly often is, is reform. So that's you know, very different from the Orthodox. But what led you to make Aliyah? Well, that Zionism thing, um, partly because of the family history. You know, when, you're, when your family thought that they were, you know, they, they'd been in, in Frankfurt for a few generations. My great-grandfather had founded a synagogue which was burned down in 1938 on Kristallnacht. Um, you know, when you think that, that they thought they were safe um, and then they had to flee, and I love England, I really do. Um, but hey, for the first time in 2,000 years, the Jewish people got their country back. Um, it was very compelling. I went to a, um, a kind of Zionist day school. Uh, I went on holiday a few times. Um, the weather's a lot better <laughs> in Jerusalem than it is in London. I'm not saying that was you know, the determining factor. I went to Hebrew University. There was this gorgeous red-haired American woman in my political oh. science class <laughs> who spoke good Hebrew. That was 30-something years and three kids ago. So that was, you know, that was a draw as well. So the whole thing, but mainly you know, Zionism, the belief that, that the Jewish people are better off if they have somewhere to call their own, even if it's a really small place in a, in a really nasty neighborhood. True. Uh, you are a media superstar in Israel. What, what <laughs> no. led, yes you are, what led you to pursue a career in ju journalism? Well, at first I'm not a media superstar anywhere, um, but I run a, 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 a well-trafficked website, a popular website, and all I've ever done is journalism. Before I moved to Israel, I, I went to um, like a one-year pre-university um, journalism program, which was the first time that I kind of used my brain. I was a terrible student at high school. 
um, incredibly lazy, and then I, I signed up for this journalism school, and I thought, wow, this is, this is good, I like this. So I'd studied, I'd worked on a local paper in London for less than a year, and then I made Aliyah, I went to Israel, and I went to work at the Jerusalem Post in the evenings as an editor um, while I was studying during the day at Hebrew University. So it's all I've ever done, and that was, you know, 30 odd years ago. And then you landed the chief, weren't you chief editor? I was editor of the Jerusalem Post, yeah, later on, and then, and then I set up the Times of Israel, yeah. Yes, let's talk about the Times of Israel. That was founded in 2012, I think. Yeah, sure. And what makes it so unique? Um, well, its, it's heart is, is in a good place. It was set up to try and ensure that people who want to know what's going on in Israel would, would be able to get uh, fair-minded um, journalism. It's not linked to any particular party. Uh, I have a That's unusual today. Uh, increasingly so. I mean, there's, you know, journalism, uh, print journalism, text journalism is very hard economically because you don't, you, don't you don't earn as much revenue from a website as you do from people paying to, to read your newspaper, to buy your newspaper. And therefore, a lot of titles either have some political agenda or some business agenda. Our agenda is really to try and, and ensure people can understand what's going on in Israel and the Jewish world and so on. And I think because it's deemed to be, I mean, we're not perfect, we make mistakes. Um, but we are trying to tell the story you know, honestly and fairly, and I think people appreciate that, and, and that's why it's succeeded. What made you partner with news outlets around the world? I think you have currently have nine uh, so sort of Jewish weeklies, right. yeah. Well, w so we built this nice platform, and if you if you look at the site, you'll see it's aesthetically it's a, it's a nice site, and there's a lot of Jewish journalism around the world, and and a lot of Jewish newspapers that have. Uh, nice content and not much resonance online, and it's hard. You know, building a website is quite expensive. Having any kind of an impact is quite you know hard to do. Um, so we have this website that's pretty widely read, and we built. It's basically it's like a partnership program. Uh, we help um, newspapers around the world, Jewish weeklies, uh, build websites that are based on the same sort of model that we use. When you're reading the Times of Israel in their area. Um, when you're on our page, you'll see their, their module with their latest story. So that gives them a bit, a bit more resonance. It helps in terms of advertising. You know, it's, it's, uh, well, it only it's works. More, a, a broader sense of dissemination of information. Right. Yeah. And it's, well, it's also, you know, if we're kind of covering the sort of big Israel story, there are lots of Jewish weeklies. I mean, we, we, among the partners is the Australian Jewish News, the, the London Jewish News, which are both big papers in, the, in those countries, and some weeklies in the United States, Jewish weeklies. It means that you've got the local coverage and you've got the, you know, the sort of big diplomatic and, and political coverage as well. Um, and it, yeah, it, only, it works because it's good for both sides. It's good for us, good for them. You've recently launched a podcast called People in the Pod. Mm. What made you enter the audio arena? Well, uh, mainly I think you watching, did this in September. Yeah, it's not, it's not going for terribly long, and it's because you watch, you know, you watch members of your family, you know, uh, wow, they're they're listening to podcasts. My wife and my daughter are both, you know, huge fans of various podcasts. You realize, you know, in Israel we don't have. That's actually not true. I was going to say we don't commute and spend hours in the car, but we do spend hours in the car because the traffic's, you know, pretty bad as well. But I think it's, you know, it's it's a big deal in the states, especially for people who are commuting, and it's a nice way to to get something out of your journey rather than sort of fretting over the traffic. And it's, you know, it's very immediate. There's an immediacy to, to, a, to, a, to a radio broadcast, which is what it is, you know, essentially, that, that text doesn't give you. So it's another aspect. And it's, uh, you know, we, the last time I was, in, I was in the States, I was shopping around for all the right microphones and stuff, <laughs> so that, you know, because it's much easier to get that kind of stuff here. But yeah, people like it, and it seems to be, you know, growing in popularity. I want to hear more about this, but we need to take a break. Okay. We'll be right back after this brief message. Coming up. Journalist David Horowitz weighs in. Are American Jews more divided than ever? What's the best kept secret in new cars? It's that you can get a brand new Mini at Brandon Mini Palm Beach for under $21,000, which includes free maintenance for three years. No kidding. Plus, free membership to the fun Mini Club of South Florida for road trips and autocross, and even more with club room social events. Mini is more than just driving. It's about having fun with the Bremen Mini community. Learn about Bremen Mini at BremenMini.com. Mini's for under $21,000. Free maintenance, mini club, and club Bremen benefits. It's a no-brainer. Bremen Mini is the right choice. Eat, drink, and enjoy Shabbat services at Temple Beth El's Friday Night Happenings. Cocktail reception and kosher dinner at 5.30, followed by our creative, musically-driven Shabbat service. Traditional to progressive, the food and music change every Friday, and you'll want to stay for complimentary dessert. Plan to spend the whole evening here, and you'll walk away and you'll say, wow, we're coming back next week. 
Welcome at Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat services at Temple Bethel. Open to everyone. Join us every Friday night. Good Greek living in storage. Your superhero movers. More moving horror stories. Slick salesman makes you a great deal. Sleazy movers hold everything hostage until you pay a higher fee. As a former police officer, I've heard all of the moving horror stories. But you can trust me and my pros, and we'll have you saying, Opa! Call Star Star Greek. Good Greek, moving in storage. Your superhero movers. We're back with David Horowitz talking about journalism. How is journalism in Israel different from that in the United States? Hmm. I'm not sure that it's radically different. I think some of the challenges are the same. You know, you're... you're Essentially, in, in, in the journalism that I do, and I think that applies in the States, you've got this contradiction between speed and accuracy. Right? If you're not fairly fast, you become irrelevant, and you kind of want to be right, and you can't do both. You know, the, far, the more quickly you publish material, by definition, the, the less likely every little aspect is going to be correct. So, you know, that's, that's a real challenge. Uh, we live in an era now where, I mean, it used to be you'd make mistakes because you'd make mistakes because right. of human error. Uh, that still happens. Uh, but you're also, you're, you're, you're grappling with a really complicated environment in which some people are actively disseminating misinformation. And, you know, the, the longer you, the more experienced you are, and I've been doing this for a long time now, you know, you think you've sort of seen everything, but you discover, well, there's things, you know, you had never realized before. So I wrote a piece about, it was a, it was a while ago, maybe even a year ago, which was revelatory to me. Uh, having spoken to somebody who was, um, he was working in the foreign ministry, he, di he directed me to the Israeli foreign ministry, he told me some stuff. Um, and he, he pointed out, and I, I wrote about it, uh, the degree to which you can so uh, misinform uh, the fake news. With, with, with such sophistication. So, for example, the head of the Israeli Mossad, the Israeli uh, External Intelligence Agency, gave a speech at Harvard not so long ago, at a think tank at Harvard. And somebody, um, basically, they ghosted, they replicated Harvard's website. So all of, all of the material on all the various pages was there. And then they added a false page, which was a false report on this guy's speech, in which he allegedly, he didn't, in which he allegedly claimed that a senior Israeli politician was a Russian spy. Now you look at that page, and you would have thought, oh, the head of the Mossad has said that this guy is a Russian spy. And it's, it, it, it is completely credible. Uh, and you just look, the only way you would realize that it's off is that when you look at the URL, the web address, there's one letter out. It's not actually the Harvard site. It's, you know, they had, they had uh, um, purchased a very, very similar domain, replicated the entire site, published a false article, and then sent it out via various Twitter users, some of which were fake, and they'd sent it to Israeli journalists. Now that's really, really hard wow. to spot. And, and now the content was so dubious that it didn't enter the Israeli mainstream because enough people raised an eyebrow and thought, well, why would he say that? And, and looked a little deeper. But those are things that you know, most people, even now, and this, that kind of thing's been around for a little while, I'm sure to most viewers, you know, that's, wow, I, I, you know, that's, that's just astonishing. And there's other, I'll give you one other example. I, I don't want to take the whole, you know, all of our time talking no, about this. but it's fascinating. Okay, it's good. So there was, you know, there was an, an event in Israel not long ago where Tel Aviv hosted um, uh, Paris, basically. It was an exhibition of all things related to Paris. And then Paris reciprocated. And they had something called Tel Aviv sur la Seine. Tel Aviv on the Seine, like a little exhibition of nice Israeli things. In the run-up to that event, the mayor of Paris and various journalists and key people got inundated with, with tweets um, what warning that this was going to be a disaster, that anti-Israeli activists were going, to, um, were going to resort to violence to try and stop this, complaining that Paris was hosting Tel Aviv and so on. And it looked like a real Twitter storm, and it looked like there was real popular opposition to the idea. And it wasn't. It wasn't. It was manufactured. Uh, it was something called, the, the term is astro, astroturfing, where you're faking a Twitter outcry by all kinds of automated systems and taking over Twitter accounts and so on. Uh, amazingly, you know, the, first of all, they realized it just in time, but I don't think they were going to cancel anyway, because they decided, no, we're not going to give in to this. But they thought they were taking a stance against some real massive protest 
They weren't, actually. Last thing, there's a pop singer called Lourdes, New Zealand pop singer. She cancelled the show in Israel because she thought she was being inundated with protests on her Instagram feed. And she wasn't, it turned out afterwards. Just a few people manufacturing a fake storm. So that's some of the kind of stuff that you're up against. So how do, you get, how do you monitor this? How do you get on top of it? You, you know, look, you have to, tr first of all, you don't always get it right. And there are things that, uh, that you, know, you, you report on and that turn out to be, well, that wasn't quite the case. Uh, you do your best, you try to be informed, you, you, you sort of walk around <laughs> with kind of one eyebrow permanently raised. You know, when you're hearing a story, well, is that probable, is that credible? Just the last few days, there was a report in a Lebanese TV station which purported to detail the Trump administration's Middle East peace plan. And it was full of detail. Now, it's been denied by the administration. It was very widely reported in Israel, and we reported it. We reported it, though, with a great deal of skepticism, stressing that it was unconfirmed, stressing that there were elements in it that didn't really make sense and so on. So you either realize, I don't, I'm not sure, I, I, the, report, the report is a true report, whether it's based on accurate information is a whole different subject. So you, you, you try to spot the real lies, you try to impress upon your readers that you're skeptical when you think you ought to be skeptical, it's complicated. It is complicated. Yeah. I'm going to shift gears for a minute. What do you think about a disconnect between Jews of the diaspora and Israeli Jews? Look, I think there's, you know, by definition, Israel was revived in 1948 and now we're in 2019. So, you know, people made their choices. A lot of people chose to, to be part of, of the revived state and a lot of people chose not to. And believe me, that's just fine, okay? I'm not the Aliyah emissary and I don't think, you know, people have to choose the lives that they think are right for them. But by definition, of course, you know, the, I think the world was, you know, and world jury was, wow, Israel's been revived and, and decades have passed and they've taken their, their necessarily different courses. They have different challenges. You know, Israel is in a, in a physical, relentless battle for survival. Uh, you might say diaspora jury is in a kind of a, a relentless uh, challenge of, over its identity and uh, assimilation and where the lines should be drawn and what balances should be found. They have different agendas and different stresses. So by definition, you're going to have a disconnect. At the same time, you, you can communicate more easily, right? We can, we can all be in touch with everybody else all the time. Uh, even the, the physical, you know, trip to Israel or trip from Israel is much more straightforward. And therefore, you know, I think there are different agendas, but I, 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 I wish that the dialogue was better. Uh, you know, there's a program in Israel, or a program between Israel and diaspora Jews called Birthright, which is basically if you're a young diaspora Jew and you want to go to Israel, they'll fund your trip. They'll take you to Israel for 10 days. It's a combination of philanthropic funding and a bit of Israeli government funding and so on, right? It's statistically very powerful. Big deal, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we kind of need a bit the other way as well. I think we should have lots of Israelis who have no idea really what's going on. Many Israelis have no idea what's going on in the Jewish communities. I think, you know, we, we need to understand each other better. Um, we're all in this together. There's not that many Jews. We make an awful lot of news and therefore I think people think there's vast, there's, there's maybe 15 million Jews in the world, 6 million in Israel, 6 million in the States and, and you know, not very many anywhere else. So, you know, we, since, since, since we, 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 you know, we, we're, we're not so many and we have lots of challenges, we should be uh, communicating more effectively with each other, I think. We really should. We need to take a final break. We'll be right back after this brief message. Coming up, journalist David Horowitz on the challenges taking place right now in Israeli society. Morse Life Memory Care is making a difference in the lives of our residents with innovative programs that offer them a more rewarding future. Our goal is to give our residents more time. Time for programs that help cognition, for favorite foods in our open kitchen any time of day, for fun with new friends, and time for family, free from care and worry. Most importantly, for the compassion and dignity they deserve. What's the best kept secret in new cars? It's that you can get a brand new Mini at Bremen Mini Palm Beach for under $21,000, which includes free maintenance for three years. No kidding. Plus, free membership to the fun Mini Club of South Florida for road trips and autocross, and even more with club room social events. Mini is more than just driving. It's about having fun with the Bremen Mini community. Learn about Bremen Mini at BremenMini.com. Minis for under $21,000, free maintenance, Mini Club, and Club Bremen benefits. It's a no-brainer. Bremen Mini is the right choice. We're back with David Horowitz talking about Israel and journalism, and we're going to take a moment to talk about politics. What's happening in Israel? <laughs> Three national elections within less than a year, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. 
How debilitating is the political uncertainty to the functioning of the country? That's a good question, and it's, you know, you'd like to, well, it's just, it's all terrible, but it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not as terrible as you might think. So there's a transitional government, and there are, there are limitations on what they can do, but, you know, the, 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 gov the country functions for sure. There are committees that don't sit, there are budgetary allocations that are not agreed. It's not something to, to joke about, but, you know, we do, we do function. The flippant way of looking at this is it's kind of, you know, we, we had an overabundance of democracy. And it's interesting, for me, talking about it in Florida is interesting because here, you know, every vote matters in Florida all the time, right? So Israel is kind of like, you know, a big Florida. All the votes matter all the time. We have pure proportional representation in Israel, no constituency system. So nationwide, uh, once your party clears the sort of minimum threshold, if you get more than three and a quarter percent of the votes nationwide, you get your seats in parliament. The result has been always, throughout Israeli history, multi-party coalitions, and many, many parties in, in the parliament, in the Knesset. I mean, you have 320 million people here, and you seem to manage with two parties. Right. And we have 9 million people and 30 parties running for election, and 10 of them get seats. And the last two elections, nobody could, could get a majority, because, because various parties were, were playing very hard to get, for, for better and poorer reasons. I think the big picture, really, is that we are, we're a country in a, in a very challenging region with no term limits for our prime minister. So here, you, you, know, you know that the president, like him, don't like him, one term, two terms, that's all there is. Netanyahu has been in power for a decade. He's kept the country safe, and people that's, respect him for that. That's critical. Which is really the biggest of all the big deals. Uh, but internally, he's, he's either loved or loathed. He's a divisive figure. Uh, he has a real challenge this time because the party running against him has three former army chiefs at its helm, including the head of the party, a guy called Benny Gantz. And what's happening is either that Israel is kind of incrementally pulling away from Netanyahu and it's taking three elections to do it, or he will somehow bounce back. He's facing corruption charges, very, very complicated cases that you'd be very foolish to try and prejudge. So that, that mix, it's incredibly fraught and we're very, very divided. And when you do all the arithmetic, uh, the way it has played out for two elections in a row, he didn't quite get re-elected, but the other guys couldn't get him out either. So then the next question would be, well, why will it change next time, which is going to be in March? So I, I can't answer it, so it's good that you didn't ask me. Um, I don't know how it's going to play out, but it doesn't take much of a shift to kind of remake the arithmetic. So uh, you know, after March, you'll, we'll you'll know, yeah. How, um, how did Boris Johnson's win in the UK affect Israel? Well, first of all, as an ex-Brit, uh, it's a really big deal. Um, you know, I think Jeremy Corbyn, the opposition leader, is an anti-Semite, and that's not something I would say easily. Uh, well, did that? You think that played into the election? I think it did. I, I think he, he's an obsessive um, critic of Israel. I think you can be a critic of Israel, but when the only country that you focus your anger and criticism on is Israel, then 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 that's extending into into darker places. So I don't think Br British people didn't vote no to Corbyn because they were worried about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, but it was in the mix. And I'll just tell you, it was, it was really interesting. On the morning after the election, um, Sky News, which is a big uh, cable channel, uh, satellite channel in, in Britain, the presenter was asking the chairman of the defeated Labour Party. And she's, she's not Jewish, and, and the view, most of the viewers, I mean, the anti-Semitism thing was, was not something that you would have thought would have been front and centre. Right. She says to him, didn't voters just think, well, this guy's an anti-Semite, and therefore they didn't want to trust him with the security of the country? Now, that's, you know, that was such an interesting way of looking at it. So it wasn't the election issue. The election issue was Brexit, leaving Europe, and so on. But Corbyn's positions and his character and that anti-Semitism thing were in the mix. And Anglo jury, you know, they were telling the pollsters if he gets elected, 10, 20, 30, 40 percent in one poll, I think, were talking about, well, thinking about leaving. It was a really big deal. And he, you know, Corbyn lost by, by a lot. Yes. Um, so I think there was a lot of relief among Anglo Jews. I, in Israel, you know, we watched it closely. I think he would probably have, ha have instituted an arms embargo on Israel. I think he would have much um, reduced the, the, the warmth of the ties. So that hasn't happened. And in fact, just, you know, just now Prince Charles has announced he's going to make his first official visit to Israel in a, in, in a month's time. So, you know, things are things sometimes good things happen. You know, yes, that's, that's I see what that. It was. Um, Speaking about that, do you think Trump's administration is more popular in Israel than prior administrations? That's a good question. I, don't, I, don't, I can't give you an empirical answer. I think Israelis um, judge American presidents you know, on, on very often on, on a kind of emotional uh, level. 
if you look at, first of all, the relationship is very good. The Israel-US relationship, it's very good and it's very important, I would say, in both directions. You know, we're on the front line against the bad guys who, we're just a little Satan in Israel. You are the big Satan for Iran, for example. Right. So the more we, you know, we, we can gather intelligence and, and, and take the measures necessary to keep Israel safe, you know, by extension and in partnership, uh, we're certainly helping the United States. So it's a, it's a vital relationship. The ups and downs with presidents have been, have been, like I say, kind of on, the, on an emotional level. And if you think about it, you know, Israelis love Bill Clinton. You know, if he converted to Judaism and moved to Israel, we'd elect him to any job in the land. And we liked the second George Bush, again, because of a kind of a sense of warmth. And much less uh, Obama and George Bush Sr. Because they didn't emote that kind of uh, um, gut uh, affection for Israel. So Trump is seen in Israel as somebody instinctively warm to Israel. Uh, most Israelis are very happy that he recognized Jerusalem as our capital. Uh, Israelis were, wor were worried and are worried, I think, about his talk of, of pulling out of Syria, and that's been adjusted a bit. Um, you know, the more isolationist an American administration, especially when it comes to the Middle East, the more worried we are. We, we think that's bad for America, certainly bad for us. The, the less America is present, the more Russia is present. Right, it's and, scary. You know, and they're, they're pals with, with our enemies, with the Iranians and the Syrians and so on. So those are some of the parameters, I think. We have to end, so I want to end on a positive note. <laughs> what makes you hopeful about the future of the global Jewish community? Okay, so, um, well, first of all, because miraculously we survive against all odds and uniquely. Um, from an Israeli perspective, there's masses of stuff to be optimistic about. I mean, w we talked a lot about the challenges. Israel, Israel is, an, is an incredible source of inspiration, including in things like you know, tech and, and so on. We, you know, we're the most innovative country in the region for sure, and one of the most in the world, um, partly because of the army experience. People go to university later in Israel. They have no fear of failure. They can innovate. All those things have fueled this transition from sort of Jaffa oranges to tech. So you're pioneering in, in medicine and in water uh, um, desalination. We taught Africa drip irrigation. There's an Israeli innovation now to, to make water out of hot air. I, I it's kid incredible. you not, right? It's an incredible thing. But the most encouraging thing, I, and I hope all your viewers will, you know, all our viewers will agree with this, you look at the younger generation and, you know, we're producing fine people uh, in the Jewish community around the world, I'm sure, and in Israel, I know. You know, I look at the younger generation and these are, these are fine, capable, motivated people. So I think that's a pretty big source of optimism. Great way to end. Thank okay. you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Mosaic is brought to you by these generous sponsors and underwriters. Learn how you can support Mosaic by visiting jewishpalmbeach.org slash mosaic.